here tonight. I don't know how many of you maybe have a life verse or something like that. And don't feel bad if you don't. You don't have to. I'm not even sure if this is what I would call a life verse. But it has been a verse that has made a great change in my life in the past that uh, wouldn't have came about otherwise. And that's in our passage uh, for tonight. Uh, This verse has changed my life. And it changed my life through somebody preaching on the text. Imagine that. And uh, that's what I'm going to try to do here tonight. I have part of this verse, uh, well, my wife did, uh, have part of this verse engraved on my wedding band. Uh, It kind of tells you how much it means to me. And I thought I would bring that to you here tonight. Let's begin reading the first two verses. Then we'll skip down and read five through nine. This will be our text for tonight. Amaziah was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. Verse 5. Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and made them captains over thousands and captains over hundreds, according to the houses of their fathers throughout all Judah and Benjamin. And he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them 300,000 choice men able to go forth to war that could handle spear and shield. He hired also an 100,000 mighty men of valor out of Israel, For a hundred talents of silver. But there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel, to wit with all the children of Ephraim. But if thou wilt go, do it. Be strong for the battle, and God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God hath power to help and to cast down. So this is Amaziah's dilemma. And it brings us to verse 9, which is my life verse. And Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do for the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? And the man of God answered, This is a great answer. The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. The title of the message tonight is simple. It's much more than this. I want you to see the context tonight here of this passage, and without going into a lot of detail, I want to explain to you what Amaziah is doing here. This is approximately 750 BC. Amaziah is the eighth king now from David's line. He's now ruler over the southern kingdom of Judah. And of course, we're this time we're the divided kingdom. You've got the northern kingdom referred to in our passage tonight as Israel. And then the southern kingdom referred to many times as Judah. He is preparing to go to war against Edom. Now, as many of you know, Edom, along with Ammon and Moab, are these constant thorns in Israel's side during this period. They are these enemies that are all around them. And throughout Israel's history, you have an ebb and flow between conflict between all of these nations. Under the godly leadership of good kings like David and Solomon, God allowed or basically made sure that Edom, Moab, and Ammon would be kept in subjugation. They would not rebel. One of the judgments against Israel when they were walking away from the Lord is the Lord would allow these nations to gain power. And so that's Amaziah's dilemma at this point. In Jehoshaphat's day, Jehoshaphat said this about the nation of Edom in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. He said, They come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. So that's the idea with Edom. They've, they've come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. So they hate Israel, and they hate Israel's God, Jehovah. 
And any time Edom could get a chance to attack and annoy and harass Israel, they did. By the way, the book of Obadiah is basically that exact same thing happening at a very weak point in Israel's history. And God says, I am going to judge Edom for this severely because of what they've done to their brother in a time of weakness. But that's Obadiah. That's not where we're going to be here tonight. So they've rebelled, and Amaziah is going out to put down this rebellion. That's our context. <clears throat> and the question that this text brings to us is this, and this is a question I want you to ask in your heart tonight. Do you believe that God is able to give you much more than you have now? I'm not necessarily talking about money at all. That's really not the point. Do you believe he's able to give you much more than this, even in making decisions that seem like you're going to lose? Now, if you were checking a box and I was giving you a test, I'm sure you would check the yes box. But if I were to ask you, has there been an example in your life recently where you've put this principle to the test, what would you be able to say? Would you be able to share with me a point in time in your recent history where you've trusted the Lord to give you much more than this in any area specifically? That's where the rub comes here tonight. I want to focus on three vitally important areas where God is able to give you much more than this in our message. And number one tonight, God is able to give you much more than this by way of friends. And this would almost even also include family. Verse number 6, he, Amaziah, hired also 100,000 mighty men of valor out of Israel for 100 talents of silver. So you might be thinking, what's so bad about that? They're the people of God, aren't they? I mean, he's hiring Israelites. What's wrong with that? Nothing. That's fine. But it wasn't fine. So you have the divided kingdom at this point, and Amaziah is looking, it's like, I, okay, I don't think I have enough. I don't think I've got enough military might or, or men to be able to win this victory on our own. I've got to go out and hire a mercenary army. And by the way, I'm going to go up here and do it from the northern kingdom, and I'm going to expect God to bless that. Makes sense, very pragmatically, right? This should work. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, we're not hiring Moabites. We're not hiring Ammonites. These are Israelites we're hiring. And surely they can come down and fight with us for a time. But if you know anything about the northern kingdom, they never had a good king, ever, not one. Uh, they were a group that was involved in probably one of the most... Uh, damaging, syncretized form of religion. And basically, in a nutshell, this, we're going to worship Jehovah this day, and we're going to worship another false god this day, and it's all going to work great. Jeroboam sets up his golden calves. He sets up one in Bethel, and the other he puts up there in Dan. And he does this on purpose so that the people in the northern kingdom will not go down to Jerusalem and worship at the temple. So he makes basically a fake religion to keep them up there in the north. These are the people he's hiring. Uh, they would keep the golden calves, uh, even though Jeroboam's long off the scene by this point. This religion is still going there. This is an apostate kingdom. But yet Amaziah, under pressure, pragmatically, I'm going to go hire these soldiers. I'm going to pay all this money. And they're going to come down and they're going to help us win. That's the idea. Now the question becomes, and it's a, it's a good question, and I think the reader ought to be asking themselves this as they come through Second Chronicles 25, is, is this okay or not? And, and if not, why not? Because we can tell that the prophet here in a minute, the man of God says, this isn't a good idea. No, you shouldn't do this. There's two clear reasons why Amaziah should have not known not to do this. If you, as you may remember, Amaziah's great-great-grandfather, Jehoshaphat, also allied himself with the northern kingdom one time. And this is found, if you would, let's turn to Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 1 through 2. I'm going to share with you things tonight that Amaziah was privy to. He knew all this history. 
He had these examples. I'm not bringing you examples from the New Testament tonight that he never had heard of before. He should have known that this was wrong and should have never been attempted for these reasons. Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 1 through 2. Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. You need to know that Ahab is the king of the northern kingdom at that time. And after certain years, he went down to Ahab to Samaria. And Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him and persuaded him, this is Jehoshaphat, to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. I've got a, I, I made a little note in my Bible years ago at the end of verse 1, and I've said, why? I asked myself that. I wanted to remember that when I came through there. Why does Jehoshaphat go and join in affinity with Ahab? Do we know anything good about Ahab tonight? No, you don't. Because there's nothing good said about him. So why is Jehoshaphat down here in the, in the southern kingdom going up here and trying to build some sort of relationship with this king that's only going to turn to wickedness. I mean, Ahab's about as wicked as you can get and his wife Jezebel. But what Jehoshaphat had a problem with is he thought that by being pragmatic and that by being uh, somewhat uh, ignoring and glossing over all the sins of Ahab, that somehow they, he would be able to slowly woo Ahab out of his idolatry and all the wickedness, and he would be able to finally reunite the kingdom in this very gentle, casual, unspiritual way. And it turned out horribly. He almost got himself killed doing this. <clears throat> Get to the point where they get ready to go out to battle against the Ammonites. And uh, Ahab convinces him to disguise himself. Whether Ahab knew this or not, it really doesn't matter. But the idea was the Ammonites said, we're only going to kill the king of Israel. And they almost do it to Je Jehoshaphat because they think it's him. And with friends like Ahab, who needs enemies? So Jehoshaphat agrees and almost, you know, dies. That's the first example that Amaziah would have known of, did know about. And God spares Jehoshaphat because Jehoshaphat is overall a man of faith. I'm not denying that. And he, brings, he comes back home and there's a prophet comes out to him. And this prophet's name is Jehu. All right? And Jehu comes out to Jehoshaphat and he says this statement to him and it's amazing. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Let's say that again. This, this was God's commentary on Jehoshaphat going up and joining affinity with Ahab. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Amaziah would have known about that. And then number two... We have Amaziah's own father, Joash is his name. And we see that his friends ended up being his undoing as well. Joash starts off very well when you read his story. He starts out very well as long as he is underneath the leadership and guidance of Jehoiada, this very righteous guy. But once Jehoiada dies, then Joash's spiritual influence is gone. And then he starts capitulating on all these different things. And you see what happens to Joash. His friends come calling. This is 2 Chronicles 24 and verse 17. So Joash's spiritual influence is gone. And look what happens. 24 verse 17. Now after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king then the king hearkened unto them. So these, these princes of Judah, these are immoral people. These are wicked people. These are people trying to gain influence and power with the king. They don't have his best interest at heart. All they have is their own interest at heart. And he gives in to them. And they are his complete and total uh, undoing. We're going to find out later in a few verses it ends up being his death. 
Let's go down here and read in verse 18. We'll see what his, how did his friends, how did these friends who came and made obeisance to them, how did they help him? And they left the house of the Lord, verse 18, the Lord God of their fathers, and served groves and idols, and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not give ear. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people, and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper, because ye have forsaken the Lord? He hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him, and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, The Lord look upon it and require it. <clears throat> when it's not advantageous for them to be your friend anymore, they'll be gone like a feather on the breeze. I'm going to tell you, God is able to give you much more than this in life in the matter of friends. Not anchored to anything, these type of people are like Mr. Buy-ins from Pilgrim's Progress, only willing to go along with you when the way, winds are favorable unto them. We read verse 18 and we see that they quickly turned Joash's heart away from serving the Lord God of their fathers. He served groves, idols, and uh, murdering Jehoiada's son. What are your friends like tonight? What's your family like tonight? Are they holding you back? Are they what's getting in the way for you trusting the Lord to be able to give you much more than this? Number two, and this is probably the most obvious point in this message and this text is that God is able to give you much more than this by way of finances. And this was Amaziah's major concern. This is in verse 9. And so Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do for the hundred talents which I've given to the army of Israel? Well, I've hired this army. I've paid them this money to come down here and fight. Notice his chief concern, because the man of God's already told him to send them back. What am I going to do with all this money I've spent? How many times do we say similar things to the Lord and keep from doing his will because we say, well, what about the money? And the answer of the man of God is perfect. He's able to give you much more than this. So he takes the census of his army here, and he was worried he doesn't have enough warriors. Instead of going to God about it, you'll notice he doesn't do that. He doesn't do what, actually, interestingly, Jehoshaphat did earlier with another battle between the Edomites and the Moabites and Ammonites where Jehoshaphat basically goes up to the Lord and says, we, we have no power or might against this army, but our eyes are fixed on you, Lord, whatever you want to do. That's what we're going to do. We're going to trust you. If you take us out, fine. If you don't, praise the Lord. And the Lord fought for Israel that day. So here we have Amaziah in a weak moment. He's not trusting in God. He's trusting in the strength of men. He's, he's calculating all the consequences. He's looking at everything pragmatically. He's ignoring the faith. He's ignoring the fact that God has delivered the Israelites time after time after time after time again in their history over odds of greater than this. He's trusting in the strength of men. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. I, I love that idea in that verse. It says, lean not unto. Usually when we lean on something, we're, we're leaning on it so it'll hold us up. For some sort of support. 
We only usually lean on something we think is going to be strong enough to hold us up. And the meaning here is that if we lean onto our own understanding to hold us up, as we so often do, we're going to fall. But instead, if in all our ways we'll acknowledge him, he will direct our paths. That's what Amaziah needed to do here. And instead, after he makes the mistake, all he's worried about is, well, what am I going to do about this silver? <clears throat> Luke 16, 11 says, If therefore you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who shall commit to your trust the true riches? We must be good stewards of the unrighteous mammon if God is ever going to commit unto us the true riches of this life. Amaziah was not being faithful with the unrighteous mammon that God had allowed him to have. And believe it or not, people watch how you spend your money. It tells them everything about your walk with God. I found there's not much more of a better spiritual indicator of an individual than how they handle money. Amaziah also was not trusting God to provide in his needs at all. Instead, he was complaining about, what am I going to do for this cash that we've given to the mercenary army here? Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 20. I love these chapters because there's so much that goes on in the nation of Israel reading up to 2 Chronicles 25 that tell you what Amaziah should have done in this instance. So here in, in 2 Chronicles 20, we have the account of Jehoshaphat, Amaziah's ancestor, engaged in another battle, this time with Moab and Ammon and Edom combined. But this time, Jehoshaphat refused any outside help. Look at verse 25, 2 Chronicles 20, 25. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them they found among them in abundance, both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering the spoil. It was so much. I bring this to your attention because Amaziah would have been familiar with this battle. It just happened a few generations earlier. And it was one of the most famous times in Israel's history when the Lord fought for them. I remember when I was, well, when the Lord was challenging me about um, I gave my call it changing careers. It wasn't really changing careers. It was stopping a career and seeing if God would have another career that I didn't know about coming out of it. But uh, this was in 2007, and uh, my pastor at that time was named Benny Moran, and uh, I was 24 years old, or 20, no, no, 27, 27 at that time. Just been saved about three years. And uh, I remember he was telling me a story, and he knew that, that God was uh, working in my heart about turning away from forestry and, and going to Bible college. And he said, he says, I know you're nervous about these things. He said, you're probably worried about money. You're worried about finances. He said, everybody is. He says, I want to tell you a little story. Pastor Moran said he left uh, Fairmont, West Virginia. This was back in the um, early 60s. He said, I left Fairmont, uh, West Virginia with $100 in my pocket, a young wife who was pregnant, and no place to stay, and drove to Greenville, South Carolina. So he did. He said, from the minute he got to Greenville, he said this. He told me this. I'll never forget it. He, he, pay, he said, I paid the tithe off of my gross income from that time forward. He said, I had not been doing that up until that time, but he said, from that time forward, I did. And he said, God met his needs every step of the way. He graduated 
from Bob Jones University and planted a church in Morgantown, West Virginia in 1967. He pastored that church until his death just a few years ago. And he said this to me in his office, I've never forgotten, and he says, Steve, he said, you obey God with the tithe and we'll take care of the rest. That sounds pretty simple. It just so happens to be perfectly true. So number one, God is able to give you much more in this in the way of friends. God is able to give you much more than this in way of finances. But number three tonight, God is able to give you much more than this by way of a future. This is the other thing that so many people doubt, that God can give them much more than this by way of a future. And then they will not trust in him. They will not step out in faith because they're scared that God is going to destroy their life. And that, of course, is a deception that comes not from the Lord, but from someone else. In verse 10 and through 12, we have not read. I've been kind of hard on Amaziah up to this point. But thankfully, Amaziah gets it right. Then Amaziah separated them to wit the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again. And wherefore their anger was greatly kindled against Judah, and they returned home in great anger. They were mad. And Amaziah strengthened himself and led forth his people and went to the valley of salt and smote of the children of Seir ten thousand. That's Edom, by the way, children of Seir. And other 10,000 left alive did the children of Judah carry away captive and brought them up into the top of the rock and cast them down from the top of the rock that they all were broken in pieces. Amaziah did not know exactly what the future would hold, but he had the promises of God as an anchor for his faith. How easy it is to get apprehensive about the future the unknown can be a scary thing, but I want to tell you tonight, it can be an exciting thing too. Because probably one of the most important things that a person learns in their maturity of the Christian life is it's exciting what God is going to do and not always be able to know. Not to be able to just look down 5, 10, 15, 20 years and know how everything's going to happen. The Lord does not work that way. He's never worked that way with anyone in the scripture, and he's not going to work that way with you or with me. Not one of us is going to be the exception to this. We have to walk by faith and not by sight, and that's one step at a time. The Lord lays truth at our feet. He lays conviction at our feet. He lays repentance at our feet, and we must take that step. I don't know where the next step is going to be. This is the one I'm supposed to take now. So many times you and I won't take the step now because we're worried about the 10th step ahead. He doesn't operate that way. Many of you are familiar with the book, I'm sure, The Hiding Place by Corrie ten Boom and the atrocities that she suffered at the hands of the Nazis for being a Jew. And she would make this powerful statement in her book. She said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. An unknown future to a known God. I wonder perhaps maybe if we're struggling to trust an unknown future to God it's because we don't know him very well, perhaps. We're doubting him. I believe Amaziah was not all that unlike many of us. He was afraid to let go. He was afraid to make a faith-based decision and trust the Lord to do something that it seemed like humanly was not going to work out. Do you really want to be closer to God tonight than you have been? Has God laid a decision, maybe major, maybe minor, I don't know, at your feet and... And you've been resisting. Maybe you even convinced yourself that no, no, he's not. He's not challenging me about this. No, he's not leading me this way. No, that's just I'm imagining these things. 
Well, if it keeps coming back to you, I, I dare say he's, you're probably not imagining things. I challenge you to find one example in the Bible of someone who God failed, who stepped out in faith. Find me one example of someone outside the Bible that God failed. You know it can't be done. David said in Psalm 37, 25, I've been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed baking bread. I see many parallels in the life of Amaziah and my own, at least up to this point in Amaziah's life. I was saved 20 years ago at the age of 24 in, in 2004. I had finished secular college by that time. I, uh, so I, I, did not, I did not grow up in, uh, in, a, in a church like this. Uh, did not grow up around uh, perhaps the environment that some of you are, are privileged to be around. My life was geared towards doing basically what I wanted to do. Uh, Self-gratification, selfishness, whatever. I, I went into a career that I thought would give me the type of job that would provide me enough income to accomplish the hobbies of my life. And I guess I was pl planning to do that until I died. Which, by the way, is how most of the secular world operates when you think about it. I graduated from West Virginia University. I was well on my way to living the American dream. I, I wasn't wealthy, but I really wasn't trying to be. I didn't go into a career that was going to make me that. I had friends. I had finances. I had my future all planned out. But then something started to happen. God started to do something to me after I trusted him as Savior in, in 2004. There was an emptiness that settled in, an ever-increasing awareness that I was not doing what God wanted me to do for my life. I, and it, this was relatively easy for me in a sense. I had made the decision to go to forestry school as an unbeliever. God wasn't in that. I, I could have convinced myself he was, you know, as people do, but he wasn't. <clears throat> And I, I couldn't get away from that. I, everything that I had made and planned in my life, I made all these decisions as a lost person. He wasn't behind those. It was what I wanted to do. And it wasn't a lightning bolt from heaven or anything, but just the, the sweet, convicting power of the Holy Spirit that wouldn't go away. After two years of fighting, you know, by the way, two years of fighting the Lord about this call, I didn't tell anybody. It. And that's how we usually work, by the way. We don't tell anybody about it. And we'll go around. I mean, I've been saved now for three years. So two, two, of, these, uh, two of these three years, I was uh, around Christians. There's other people. Didn't tell anybody. We carry these things around. So we're afraid to let anybody know that this is really what's going on. But nonetheless... At a revival meeting in the spring of 2007, I stopped fighting, and it was the first time I'd ever walked an aisle in my life, actually. As honestly as I could, I said, God, if you'll show me what you want me to do, I'll, I'll give up my career if that's what you want me to do. I'll let it go. But I didn't know that that's what was going to happen. I, I, I just knew I had never surrendered that to him in an honest way before. And I knew I had now. And then I was going to basically trust him to work through circumstances of life to see if that's what he wanted. And he did. And like Amaziah, it would mean saying goodbye to certain things. I had at that time, it, been saving everything I, I could to make a down payment on some um, forest land property in, in West Virginia, planning to build a house there and spend my days working in forestry and, 
enjoying the outdoors. But instead, I t took all that money and paid off my college loans, paid off my car, and put the rest of it into surviving for the next three years, is how I like to call it. Uh, I got down to the last semester of college, couldn't make the payments. I had been able to pinch pennies. Bob knows I can pinch pennies. It's kind of a joke of ours. Um, I've been able to pinch pennies all the way down to the, the last semester, and I just I didn't have it. And I told the finance department, I told them I, I didn't have it, I'm not going to have it. And so they were, very, they were very kind and nice, and they gave me some advice and things to do. And, uh, it, was, it was a wonderful time. But uh, I remember there was, a, there was a point in that, in that, uh, in that third semester uh, where I looked at my a bank account and I had $17. $17. And this is, people have been much worse than me. I mean, people have nothing. So I was like, okay, I started out with 33000 and I'm down to seventeen. when that whole journey began, you know. Now, you might be, you might even be like crying in your heart right now as I say that, you know. As God is my witness. I can tell you tonight, it really didn't bother me that much. It doesn't matter. And it didn't. I was, it was incredible. And everything that society tells us is just such a lie. And I had such peace that that was the smartest use of $33,000 I'd ever made, <laughs> even though I didn't have any of it. I didn't have it invested in anything. Well, I did, but I didn't know it. <laughs> William Carey said the future is as bright as the promises of God and that's how it needs to be looked at Amaziah if he would have been looking over his uh, the word of God which he had up until that time if he would have been looking back over the history that he had he would have known the promises that Jehovah had made to the nation of Israel for him but he got his eyes off of them forgot about them, chose to give in to fleshliness and weakness and trust in the arm of man. And he had this man of God, totally unnamed, by the way, unnamed man of God come by and say, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. And it's become my life verse, and I hope that perhaps it's impacted somebody here tonight. I do have one final question for you, though, and it is a little probing, but it would be this. What would you have to say tonight is your this that you're afraid to let go of? Our Heavenly Father, tonight, whatever the this is for your people gathered here tonight, I pray that they would understand you are able to give them much more than what they are worried about losing for doing the will of God. And that's really what it is. We are worried about losing and missing out for surrender, for going all in by faith and trust in you, and we're doubting that you will show yourself strong on our behalf. And may you deliver us from it. I know... It's easy to give in to the flesh, but it's also not an excuse to give in to it. And may we in these days remember and know the promises that you have made in the scripture to the believer and trust that you are able and will give us much more than this. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.